Alrighty guys, so uh, we're gonna get things going here. Um, I am not going to act uh, for one second like this isn't kind of weird. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so I, I know for the rest of the semester uh, this is gonna be uh, kind of the way things are run. Uh, uh, you guys are gonna get lectures from me uh, from my home office here um, and it's not gonna be like class but I'm gonna do my very best to make it feel as though you are sitting in class as best I can at least uh, with you guys watching this however you're gonna be watching this whether it's you know on your phone or a laptop or a tablet or or, or however you're uh, gonna consume uh, the uh, lectures from here on out uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to make them as uh, as digestible as possible um, while also uh, doing my very best to make sure that they're uh, kind of easy to follow if you have any questions, um, shoot me an email. I just mark down whatever slide you know we were talking about. Uh, maybe take like a s screenshot of it or something and say, hey, on this slide you were talking about this thing. What the heck were you talking about? Um, the nice thing is, is well, there are no more time constraints. So you know me, um, I love keeping you guys after class and I, I talk all the way through the end of class. Um, but... Uh, there's no time constraints. So what I'm what I'm going to try and do is these may be a little longer, right? Because I'm just going to take one unit. I'm going to do one unit at a time. Uh, but I'm going to try and make a mental note in my head uh, to make sure that I give you guys um, <laughs> a break uh, about every, you know, 10, 20 minutes. Because I, I understand. I've taken online classes before. I know. Uh, and after a while of watching some of these online classes, you're kind of going, okay, well, I need to do something else. Um, so I'll try and give you guys stop points uh, in some of the longer units uh, through the rest of the semester so that you guys can, you know, grab a bite or get something to drink or something. Um, and you're not pausing me in the middle of a sentence, but rather, uh, you know, every 10 minutes or 15 minutes or something like that, I'll say, okay, let's pause for five seconds for, you know, station identification. You guys ever listen to sports? Um, and, and I'll let you guys go run and grab something and then, uh, we'll get, we'll get back to business. Um, the one place where I left off was, uh, tornadoes. We talked about this picture, uh, the Campo, uh, New Mexico, uh, tornado and, and I, I left off here and, and I figured, well, since it was a very long spring break, I figured I would pick up where, kind of where we left off, um, you know, kind of take a couple of steps back because I'm, I'm sure you guys have uh, forgotten some of the things that uh, I lectured about, which is fine. It was spring break. Uh, but we'll, we'll start with tornadoes here. Remember, tornadoes, um, textbook definition being a rapidly uh, rotating wind that blows around a small, intense area of low pressure. Um, tornado circulation is present on the ground, and that's a tornado, uh, in a funnel-shaped cloud, sometimes not as funnel-shaped, um, with uh, dust and debris getting picked up. Um, if there's no tornado physically on the ground, but there's still stuff rotating around in the clouds or halfway down between the cloud and the ground, uh, th that's considered a funnel cloud. You'll hear a lot of times uh, on the news, they'll say, oh, a tornado touched down. No, 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 a, a funnel cloud became a tornado. Uh, a, we're gonna get nitpicky about that. Um, that that's kind of how that how that works. And, and you can get I mentioned this last class, but you can get more than one of these things on the ground at a time. Um, you know the the Pilger uh, Nebraska tornadoes, uh, the big supercell that was out there produced multiple tornadoes on the ground at the same time. It can't happen. Uh, the five textbook stages that we've got are the, the dust and whirl stage the organization stage, the mature stage, and then it shrinks back down and kind of ropes out. And then uh, the decay stage, uh, it's usually when it you know, really ropes itself out and and then it's gone. Um, those are the five textbook stages. I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna grill you guys or midterm you guys on the five stages, but do know that there are five stages. If I were to ask you on a test, for example, how many stages are there in, you know, the life cycle of a tornado? You would say, of course, five, um, not four, not six, but five. Uh, so, and tornadoes happen 
in a lot of different places around the world. But it's really unique that the United States has so many. Um, the Central Plains is the most susceptible for tornadoes in the, in the world. Uh, because you get all the right ingredients in the right place at the right time. Uh, you've got that really warm, humid uh, surface air that's getting pulled up from uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And then on top of it, you're laying uh, cooler, drier air, which is getting blown across the area off the Rocky Mountains. So uh, not only do you get a, a south wind off of the Gulf, uh, but you're also getting a, a west wind. In fact, uh, ho hold on, I'm gonna, we're going to test this out. Not only do you get, uh, hey, it works! Uh, a south wind off the Gulf of Mexico, but then you can kind of get a, a west and southwest wind aloft, and it's where those two things converge that you end up getting. Uh, see, I told you it'd be like class with me drawing stuff on the board. Um, uh, you, you get a, a situation where, and we've talked about this uh, a lot, where you get vertical wind shear, a change in wind direction with height, which allows you to organize some of these storms. Um, and, and the organization within the the thunderstorm itself is kind of the the base thing that you need in order to get a tornado you can squeeze them out of disorganized storms but that happens very rarely and it takes a very special uh set of circumstances in order to make that happen uh tornado frequency is basically highest in uh kind of the months between about march and june early july about 75% uh, percent of tornadoes develop between March and July. 75% percent of the tornadoes in, in this country uh, form you know, March, April, May, June, July, what, five months out of the year. Um, the month of May generally, typically, historically, uh, has the most tornadoes uh, per given day, uh, an average of about five per day. Uh, and uh, historically speaking, the most violent tornadoes seem to occur in April, um, and April 27, 2011 being one of the uh, more uh, violent events that we've had in history. So what do you need to get a tornado? We talked about this real quick before spring break. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. It's pretty easy to do. You get a source of spin um, underneath an updraft. That's it. That's all you need. Uh, it sounds real easy, and uh, truth be told, it probably happens a ton. Uh, because there's a lot of updrafts out there in all of the thunderstorms across all of the United States across all of the year. And there's probably a source of spin underneath those, be it outflow boundaries intersecting, uh, bare clinicity happening. Remember, we talked about that term before break, too. Uh, there's a lot of easy ways to do it. The problem is, is that the source of the spin and the strength of the updraft and the coolness of the downdraft all have to reach certain unknowable thresholds for each specific storm. So it's not as easy as, hey, we got this spinny underneath an updraft. It's, okay, we got this spinny underneath an updraft and we've got a downdraft, but the source of the spin, is it baroclinicity? Is it intersecting outflow boundaries? We don't know. So we got to know that. And then we got to know how strong is the updraft? How much cape do we have uh, on any one particular day? And given how much cape we have, what is this thunderstorm doing with said cape? And then on top of it, we've got the downdraft, the, the rear flank downdraft on the back side of this thing, which is coming down. And what's the temperature of that downdraft? We don't know. There's certain thresholds that all of these things have to reach in order for there to be a tornado. This is why it is impossible to dictate you see a tornado, you don't see a tornado. We are just starting, just starting to get on the cusp of... Uh, we can tell you this area is more susceptible to the development of tornadoes given the information we have But beyond that I, I tell you it's uh, it's tough uh, I The other thing that we're gonna run into just as a warning is my video is going to freeze in the in the corner I'll give you an example of this. I'm currently frozen. Uh, you can still hear my voice but I'm currently frozen. So it, this is another thing we're going to have to kind of deal with until I get things kind of figured out. Um, uh, while these events, the tornado events may seem, you know, like weekly down here, uh, unfortunately, um, they seem like that, but thankfully they are not. And so uh, how do we make a tornado anyway? Uh, well, 
before we go any further, I'm going to take a break. We're going to take a break. It's been 10 minutes. We're going to take a break. Before we get to making a tornado, uh, we're going to pause 10 seconds for station identification. You are uh, listening to and sort of watching uh, uh, Introduction to Meteorology and Severe Weather Forecasting, uh, GHY 326 at the University of Southern Mississippi. All right. Well, uh, I was trying. I figured, well, you know, let's turn this thing off and turn it back on. Let's see if we can't uh, fix it. Maybe if I, uh, if there's a way to refresh it. No. Maybe we look at the. Uh, let's do this. Hold on. Maybe. Aha. There we go. You just gotta, you gotta refresh it. You gotta pop us outside and pop us back inside. All right. So here we go. All right, so how do we make a tornado? It seems pretty easy, right? Um, well, it kind of is and it kind of isn't. So I explained this in class last time. I said, okay, so we've got our forward flank. Come on. We've got our forward flank downdraft, our rear flank downdraft back here. And the air that's coming into the storm here and getting into our main updraft, uh, all of that warm, humid air is riding along this little stationary boundary right here. We'll call it a stationary boundary, but uh, it's basically the difference in coolness and and warmness down here. We have a forward flank downdraft. That's where all the cold air is coming down. Here's where all the warm air is coming in. Uh, we, we talked about the right-hand rule. Remember I said you stick your, your thumbs up, give somebody a thumbs up, and the curl that you make, the curl that you make with your fingers, that's the right-hand rule. That's the direction that north is. This is the way you're rotating. You tip that on its side. You make your way into, uh -huh, you make your way into. There we go. The uh, the main uh, updraft here, and as you glide down uh, that area of baroclinicity, there is a a certain rotation that you get uh, within that air as it makes its way that direction. Now. Uh, the air is is sinking, so uh, you know as it moves this direction, it is sinking uh, because you're you're getting some semblance of cooling on one side, and because there end up being other things acting on that air as it's moving toward the main updraft, uh, you get to tip that thing into the vertical, and if you do that, underneath uh, your main updraft and the source of spin is there, which is the the bare clinicity that you're turning upward and there's enough stretching uh, you can get yourself a tornado so where does the rear flank downdraft come in well it's the thing that's coming in and kind of undercutting and scooping that up and helping to kind of pivot that thing uh, to turn it in, into the vertical so you can almost think of it as your right hand rule your air is coming in this direction well if you put a big thing here it's going to hit that and you're going to kind of scoop it up in essence uh, and give yourself a little bit of vertical motion there um, it's probably not the most uh, scientifically accurate description. There's a lot of other physical things that are happening in there. Uh, but for, uh, the, for this course, where we don't get into any of the math, that's probably the best way to look at it. Uh, here, this is top down. Here's from the side what you're seeing uh, in this uh, thunderstorm. As you, as you glide your way down uh, the, the baroclinicity in here and uh, toward uh, that, that main area, that main updraft in here, your air is coming in this way and and then the warm air is also coming in from this direction as you move down here again you're you're rotating the whole way uh, you hit that rear flank downdraft over here it pivots it up and then it starts a spinning and moving upward uh, through that one main updraft uh, remember we talked about this and uh, I, I'm not going to put this thing uh, into motion this time uh, but we talked about how uh, you know you get the the rotating air around uh, the mesocyclone and you can almost think of it like as it throwing the football I stole this from uh, from Rich's uh, thing from the SPC he got it from uh, Dr. Paul Murkowski uh, but it, it's a great illustration it really is uh, your streamwise vorticity, that's the stuff that's coming into the storm here in the mid-levels. That's not enough to create a tornado. What you need is the rear flank downdraft on the back side to scoop that air as it's coming in and turn it into the vertical underneath that main updraft. That's what's going to end up giving you uh, kind of that uh, the, the, the tornado genesis that we're talking about. 
and and again the source is spin right this has to reach some unknowable threshold the coolness of the downdraft which also has to reach some unknowable threshold and the strength of this updraft has to reach some unknowable threshold in order for us to get a tornado and when i say unknowable threshold i mean for uh for forecasting this thing to happen um once this is made once we've got this thing you can shoot stuff in there uh, and i'm sure you can pull out the necessary data that you would need you'd say okay well i know what the temperature of the downdraft is i I, I, I found the source of spin over here because I've got the difference, the bare clinicity between the warm and the cool. Um, you can maybe shoot a drone up there. You can see how fast is the updraft going. Uh, and you would then know all of those things. But that would only be after you have a tornado on the ground. So uh, remember, thinking back to our mass balance thing here, um, remember how I said all the rules always apply except when they don't? All the rules are applying here. Uh, the lower pressure develops beneath the, the storm itself. That air rises. The lower pressure stretches that column of air. Uh, and the vorticity, which is happening beneath that lowest pressure, uh, gets kind of piled up. You hit that thing with the rear flank downdraft, pivot that thing into the vertical, and bam, uh, you get yourself uh, a tornado. Uh, you've got a couple of other ways uh, that, that you can kind of visualize this happening. Um, same Markowski, same idea here. Uh, you've got uh, your air kind of coming together, your source of spin is in there, and you get that rear flank downdraft, and bam, uh, vertical uh, vorticity uh, from the surface is turned into horizontal spin, and up we go. Uh, so uh, kind of a simplified version uh, of that. Um, I thought I'd point out El Reno, and, and originally I was going to show this, but I'll, I'll let you guys uh, just kind of watch this at your leisure. Um uh, but you, you can Google the El Reno tornado. It's a fat tornado uh, on the ground. Uh, this is where I was. It's a, uh, one of the, the biggest tornadoes on record, uh, two and a half or something miles wide. Uh, wind speed estimated by radar up over, I believe, 300 miles an hour. Um, I, it was only rated in EF3. There is some dispute within the, the weather community as to whether that should be the case or not, given the fact that they had ground radar this isn't you know oh the oklahoma city radar they actually had trucks out there uh you know that were trying to figure out what the wind speed was in there and and they were able to estimate up over i believe it was 300 miles an hour uh so uh, there's some question about well, okay what was it or not but um anyway this is where i was you can kind of see the the donut hole in here uh for where it was um my red's probably not uh the best color to show up here i wonder if i can eh, no. Anyway, you guys can kind of see it in there. There it is. Um, kind of right in there. Let me clear that up. Right there was the donut hole. I was uh, down here kind of looking. This is probably about that's about four miles, give or take. I didn't want to be any closer. Um, I, I wanted to keep my distance because this was uh, uh, kind of a gnarly storm. I, I didn't want any part of it. Um, on radar, uh, getting back to uh, what these things would look like on radar, you can kind of start to see what we're talking about with that forward flank downdraft, you've got your rear flank downdraft back here, your little area of bare clinicity there, your warm inflow coming in here, and then you've got kind of that that little cold front-ish thing kind of hanging out to the back side, and there's your main updraft into the storm, and that's gonna be uh, where you end up having your tornado is you know right in right in here, right in your, your hook echo. Your, head, your biggest hail is probably going to be falling in this area here. And if we were to go back up and so you can kind of look. So there's your, your main updraft in here. There's your rear flank. There's your, in essence, cold front. There's the baroclinicity right in there. And then we go back forward again. And yeah, you can kind of you can kind of make out what we're what we're talking about in here with the rear flank, forward flank. It all kind of starts to make sense. Um, Mature supercells, as you can see, they kind of fan out as they as you move forward. So these things, uh, this is going to be traveling uh, kind of off and and kind of to the east northeast. They fan out uh, as they as you move forward ahead of them, uh, and then you've got your little hook appendage on the back side. And again, that hook area is going to be uh, where we probably have the best chance to see a tornado. Uh, the last tornado that went through uh, Hattiesburg, uh, this is what it looked like on radar a couple of hours earlier. And, and this is probably about as good a forecast as, as you're going to get 
for hours ahead of time. I mean, sure, I probably could have, the dashed lines on here, I probably could have taken this and, and kind of thinned it out a little bit. Uh, but that's probably about as good as you're going to get uh, in terms of a, a long track supercell uh, forecast. Um, this uh, picture was taken, what time was this? Uh, 728 West Coast times and 928 at night here. And it eventually uh, made it through Hattiesburg at 3 a.m. So um, a long, that's a, a long duration uh, lead time uh, there. So um, now it looks like my, my video froze again, didn't it? Uh, let's see if I can't fix it. We'll, we'll get into here. We'll take a peek. Let's take a look outside. We'll take a five second break to look outside. There's some cloud cover out there. And then we'll uh, we'll sneak back in here. There we go. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, but again, there's your there's your lead time on on that. Again, going back to radar. Uh, going back to radar real quick. And we're going to take another break here in a hot second. Uh, we talked about this way earlier in class about using that velocity data, um, but this may start to make more sense uh, when you when you think about what you're actually seeing on radar now, uh, where. The green is moving toward the radar site. The red is moving away. Uh, the velocity about where the couplet is. Remember, we were talking about where that main updraft is, where the main updraft uh, is in here. And we're looking kind of right in here, right in here. So you've got wind that's moving away and toward. And that wind that's moving toward, again, right along those zones, that's the area, that's your your area for the tornado where the couplet is going to be located. Um, you've got a couple more... Uh, looks at it here with a one near uh, Waynesboro and one near Shibuta. You got it coming, going toward there, going away here, going toward here, coming away there. And there's your, your tighter couplet, maybe not quite as tight uh, just off to the uh, west of Shibuta, but uh, the one that's off to the south of Waynesboro uh, was pretty, uh, pretty robust. This is at about 2.30 in the morning. Uh, this is the same the same storm. It was just a little bit later uh, in the morning. Uh, here's a a completely different day. Um, this is actually the last tornado that went through uh, Hattiesburg, um, and it's not always easy to make these things out. I mean, yeah, we can look on here and see discrete cells. This is fine, discrete cell. Okay, great. Uh, but man, oh man, there are days where things are just lined up down here and you can't make heads or tails about where one starts and another one ends when you're just looking at the radar, which is why it is so important to get kind of underneath things and uh, look at the velocity data. On top of it, uh, we actually tend to see a lot of weaker tornadoes around here because we end up getting some type of spin under some type of updraft with some type of downdraft. And so we end up having to warn on a lot of things because of those unknowable things, but because a lot of the thresholds that you can and cannot reach for these storms, uh, how should I say this? Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for success from Mother Nature to make these things happen. So you end up in a situation like you see here on this radar shot where you've got like a handful of tornado warnings uh, because what you're seeing on radar is that green on red, is that couplet, uh, and because you cannot know for sure, and there is some semblance of unknowability, uh, you've got to you've got to warn uh, on those things. Uh, this starts before the warning process, though. But uh, before we get to this, like I said a couple of seconds ago, uh, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll take a look outside. The stream has already begun. We'll we'll look outside. Here we go. Uh, and we'll we'll take a break, a hot break, uh, and uh, we'll pause uh, ten seconds and let you guys uh, get something to drink, something to eat. And matter of fact, I'm gonna uh, crack a soda right now, and um, we'll we'll take a, a five second break. Let you guys uh, uh, do whatever it is that you got to do. Even I don't usually get to take a, a swig during class. I'm up there just yelling at you guys for what like an hour, hour and a half. And again, if you have any questions, shoot me an email um, and uh, and let me know uh, where you've got any questions, where this is and is not making sense, and um, and I'll do my best to um, to answer those questions. Okay, so this this all starts 
There we go. Uh, this all starts early with the Storm Prediction Center. Um, uh, Rich Thompson, the guy who I stole that graphic from a little bit earlier, he let me. He let me. He was nice enough to let me. Um, works at the Storm Prediction Center. And uh, these guys, they work with the local National Weather Service offices. And what they'll do is these are the guys that are given the outlooks a couple of days in advance. They're given the mesoscale discussions a couple of hours in advance of the watch uh, process. The SPC uh, is a, a part of the National Weather Service and the, and the National Centers for Environmental uh, Prediction. Uh, so they're, they're a part of the umbrella here. And th they've got a couple of different pieces uh that they've got a different meteorite they got lead forecasters mesoscale forecasters outlook forecasters researchers support scientists super smart people um and what they'll do is they give out these convective outlooks um days in advance it goes out eight days days four through eight they'll just give two a slight and an enhanced or a 15 and a 30 percent uh days one through three they go through this marginal slight enhanced moderate and high uh depending on the severity and or depending on the intensity of the expected uh severe thunderstorms in a particular region um they'll break that down for the first two days into a tornado threat a hail threat a wind threat uh to give you kind of a an under the the hood what should we really be worried about uh thing and they'll do that on risk values uh with percentages um once you get to like the day uh, the next step is a uh, within two to eight hours they'll issue something called a a mesoscale discussion. Um, oh, hold on a second, let's let's fix that so I don't look like I'm a crazy person. Um, they'll do issue something called a mesoscale discussion, and that mesoscale discussion uh, will basically be trying to ID a specific area where a severe threat is a little more imminent. Um, and they'll try and ID if they need to put out a watch, a severe thunderstorm watch or a tornado watch in a particular area. The SPC outlooks would look something like this. Uh, and this is something that, that we may be doing a little bit later in class is having you guys uh, put together your own uh, SPC uh, style out, uh, outlooks like this. And again, days four through eight, 15 to 30%, one through three, marginal slight, enhanced, moderate, and uh, high and then underneath that they'll let you know about tornadoes and wind and hail uh, as well uh, an SPC discussion is going to look like this they're going to be talking about uh, very specific details and uh, some of the parameters that are going into the things that they're concerned about um, and they'll break it down into specific areas so like here the northwestern gulf coast and lower mississippi valley uh, they'll they'll let you know about um, advection, shear, instability, all of the things that we've talked about in class in terms of what goes into making severe weather, they're going to highlight it on here uh, and, and let broadcasters and National Weather Service folks know and other private entities uh, what exactly uh, the overall setup is. Uh, when, when you talk about mesoscale discussions, then they'll get in and they'll really hammer things down um, here's a, it's, it's more of a, a brief, very, uh, technical kind of short term -y discussion. Now it used to be, and I think this has changed recently and maybe it just never was like this. And it was only through coincidence that when they would highlight things in red, uh, it was tornado watch. When they highlighted things in blue, it was a severe thunderstorm watch. And when they highlighted things with that black hatched region that you see on there, that was an extra concern for, um, it says on here, identified threats, but an extra concern for whatever they're concerned about, that's the area they are most concerned for the threats of the highest intensity. Um, and these mesoscale discussions, they'll come out with these even after a watch. So they'll, they'll issue this and then, and then maybe you get a watch. Um, and then maybe after that, a couple of hours later, they'll issue another one. Say, hey, uh, just kind of give you guys an update, X, Y, Z. Um, so here's the mesoscale discussion from January 21st to 2.55 a.m. Um, as, uh, well, frankly, severe storms were ongoing. Um, and you can kind of see, and here's some of the things that may kind of make sense to you now that you've went through this class, uh, is recent surface analysis indicated that developing meso-low uh, now associated or now located near uh, Baton Rouge. 
uh, with the strongest pressure falls, uh, remember from Baton Rouge uh, all the way back to Macomb, uh, while the region uh, into the southwest and uh, south central uh, Mississippi has the coldest cloud tops. The cold cloud tops, that means you got that good updraft going. Um, I-, I won't read this whole thing, but let me, I'm going to kind of skip ahead here. Um, the response is being observed per backed subtly low level winds um, with associated increase in low level moistening and warm air advection. So you're getting that warm air advection, you're getting those southerly winds at the surface, um, and you add with that uh, the low level mass response they're talking about a couple of lines up, uh, and you're doing this in an area with a meso low underneath a, an area where you've got a turning of wind with height. Uh, and unfortunately, this ended up being a day where they issued a tornado watch and the tornado ended up happening. Um, and this one went through 7 o'clock in the morning, was issued at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, you can see here, primary threats, a few thunderstorms likely, uh, wind gusts um, up to 70 miles an hour possible, and a large hail is going to be possible as well. Um, and so that's that's kind of how that goes. And the other thing that, to note up here uh is um the the one place that was interesting to me uh, with this watch um was the ef2 tornado risk was low uh at this time um this was uh th- that's interesting and, and it really did ramp up as we head through as we move through the night um but uh at the time i I remember seeing that and being and and thinking to myself oh well that's good maybe something isn't happening like we were originally thinking is going to happen and then unfortunately um it it ended up that happening in in the other way uh so uh, anyway there's a there's a rundown that's the the end of the severe weather um unit we did skew tees and severe weather i kind of want to pick things up where we left off add some new stuff on top before we move on uh if you have any questions about Uh, any of the stuff we went over today, please contact me, uh, shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to get back to you guys and answer some questions. Um, If not, uh, I'll see you guys next class.